And so I got to get into the B-I-B-L-E this morning. I'm excited to share the word and teach the word with you. If you've never been here, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak the word. A lot of great churches in Lake Charles. Thanks for uh, worshiping with us. Believe God's got you here for a reason and a purpose. And uh, we, we've been talking the last couple of weeks about the plan of God, the call of God, and the will of God. You see this all throughout the New Testament. You see people uh, going after the plan of God because God says, I have a plan for you. And sometimes Christians get hung up with like, well, how in the world am I ever going to find it? And then you see words like the call of God. The Apostle Paul praying for the church at Ephesus. He says, man, that you may know the hope of of his calling. But even then you can be like, well, how am I know if I'm hearing his call or not hearing, you know, some something else? Like how do I know if it's him? How many of you ever felt that before? You're like, man, is that you, God? How do I, you can't figure it out. So the plan of God, the will of God, the call of God. But the last couple of weeks we've looked at the fact it's not hard to find. How many of y'all know God's not hiding from you? Yeah. God's not playing hide and go seek. In fact, he says, if you seek me, you will find me. You will. It's absolutely he says, hey, I, uh, 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 I'll open the door. He says that there is a knocking, and he says, I will absolutely open the door. So God's not trying to be elusive. God's not trying to, like, uh, psych you out and say, ha, 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 you thought I was here, but I wasn't. How many of y'all know that's not him? No, no, he says, my sheep hear my voice. It's so clear. So the past few weeks, we've, we've, we've looked at just taking daily steps of obedience. I'll put you right in the middle of God's plan for your life. And you can be a stay-at-home mom. You can be in the plant. You can be a school teacher. You can be a policeman. But just every day, taking steps of obedience, and you, you, you realize, man, I'm right in the middle of God's plan for my life. And you may not stay in that, that area for forever, but how many of y'all know uh, God, God can get you wherever he needs you to get as long as you'll take little steps of obedience? And then last week we saw that there's, there's the general will of God, which is for every person that's a believer. Four times in your New Testament he says, this is the will of God for you. And if you'll keep the general will of God, he guarantees you'll find the specific will. In other words, if you'll keep up with these four areas he said keep up with, then he will absolutely tell you exactly what you're supposed to do, what you're called to do. Whenever he spoke to me and said, this will be the next place you'll live and you'll start a church, that was specific for me. How many of y'all know that's not specific for everybody? It was specific for me. And then I told him, I said, well, I'm not telling Elizabeth. You got to tell him. Because I don't want to tell her. You tell her uh, this is what we're doing. I don't want to get in trouble. Because I knew she didn't want to move back to Lake Charles, Louisiana. So he did. Two weeks later, she walked in and she said, the Lord tell you we're moving to Lake Charles? I said, he did. And she, he said, she told me that too. He told me that too. I said, okay, well, get ready. We're moving south. We're going to go down there and start a church, right? That was the specific will of God. But the general will of God, I showed you last week, one of them is, he says, this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus, that you flee sexual immorality. In other words, for every believer on the planet, how many of y'all know it's God's will? for us to stay away from sexual immorality because it clogs the pipe of progress. It clogs up your ears. It keeps you from hearing clear. So if you keep those general wills, he says, you'll absolutely find yourself in the specific will. It would be the same thing. I have a daughter that's, that's about to be 17. But, you know, if she came to me at 11 and she was like, I need you to give me directions uh, to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm going to be driving there this weekend. How many of y'all know I'd have a problem with that? I said, baby, you don't need directions to drive because you don't have a license to drive. So sometimes we want God to give us a specific do this, 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 and this, but we don't have a license yet. So whenever you keep the general will of God, now you've got a license for the specific will of God, and he'll begin to speak to you about those things. But I want to talk to you this morning specifically about environments. That, 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 it, that it's easier to hear God's voice in certain environments than it is in other environments. Let's say it like this. There are some environments where you're not going to hear God very good. He doesn't speak very great. But there's other environments that, that you hear him a lot clearer. How many of y'all know just coming to church on a Sunday morning opens a portal that maybe you didn't have on Monday afternoon? Just getting, oh, magnify the Lord together. An environment is created where God can speak and you hear it clearer maybe than and then other times. But how many of y'all know you can be sitting on a bar stool and God can speak pretty loud? I've had time in my life where I was doing things I was not supposed to be, and it was like God was sitting at the bar with me. How many of y'all know I did not want him there? How many of y'all know he did not care? 
Because there was a plan for my life. There was a call upon my life. There was something he wanted me to do. So even though I'm trying to drown his voice out, how many of y'all know he can be loud? He can be loud. So, so these environments matter. And I want to start, if you, just, if you just look at Genesis, the very first verse of your Bible, it says, in the beginning, God did what? He created the heavens and the earth. Very next verse, he says, and the earth was void and without form and gross darkness covered the face of the deep. In other words, God created the earth in verse 1. And then in verse 2, something messed that world up. Now, we don't know in Scripture what that was. But how many of y'all know God wouldn't have created it in chaos? God doesn't create chaos. He creates everything good. So he created the earth. And yet in verse 2, it says... Something came in and messed the earth up. Now, there's people a lot smarter than me that debate exactly what that is that came in and messed it up. But how many of y'all know the, your Bible is not the history of the world? Your Bible is the history of God's dealing with man. So that's why there's a lot of people that are controversy about how old is the earth and what happened to the dinosaurs and, and, and did an asteroid hit the earth? Like, how many of y'all know? I don't know. I'm from Woodworth, everybody. They don't teach us these things in Woodworth, Louisiana. We're simple people up there in Woodworth, you know. We eat hamburgers from the corner store and boudin balls. I mean, we're simple, simple people. So there's people that have been debating all this stuff for years and years. I personally believe between the first verse and the second verse, what messed the earth up is Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And in the book of Revelations, it says he was flung down to the earth with his angels. I personally believe God created the heaven and the earth and everything was good. But when, when Satan got cast out and came to the earth, it messed things up. But how many of y'all know God doesn't leave things messed up? So in verse 3, he starts fixing that environment. It was void and without form and gross darkness covered. But then the Holy Spirit starts to move. And the Holy Spirit starts to move over the face of the deep. And God begins to bring that bad environment into a good environment. And he says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's all that. And then he says, light be boom. And it was good. So he cured the darkness problem. And then he starts separating the waters. He said... He separated he made one water the cloud he called that the firmament or what you would call the heavens and then he made the oceans he starts separating and then he brings the earth up out of the the he brings the land mass up out of the water then he puts birds and fishes and beasts and he starts creating all of that stuff listen 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 the point is 26 verses he creates an environment for man and then in the 26th and 27th verse he says let us create man in our image and in our likeness and the point is, God knows how important environment is. Because he spent 26 verses creating it, and then he put man in it. And, and it was only, and once he put man in that garden, it tells you it was good. It was good. It was good. How many of y'all know God's got good things for you? And God created good. He created good. He created good. He created good. And once he got it just right, he put man in the middle of good, and he said, now you take care of it. You tend it, take dominion of it, multiply it, and grow it. And he says, all of it's yours except for one tree. That's the tithe. He says, that's one little thing you can't touch. Don't mess with that. That's mine. Everything else you can have. And it wasn't until something bad came into that environment that everything got messed up. So the point is, listen, God speaks in good environments, and God creates good environments. But whenever we get in bad environments, it messes things up. How I many of y'all know you get in a good environment, and things will come bubbling up out of you? You didn't even know were there. Thursday night, we had a first Thursday service up here, and as we were landing the plane, feel like the, it was time to end the service. Something just kind of in me, and Elizabeth's like, I feel like Lord's, the Lord's still wanting to do something. So we opened the altars, and 18 people came down to the front. We began to pray, and the Lord began to speak and began to move. And in that environment, things changed. How many of y'all know we created that space, and we leaned into that space the two Tuesdays before that, we had chapel up here for Bible college. And again, there was an environment there where the Lord began to speak and move. People came down to the front, and many of them got their prayer language, and supernatural things were happening on that night. So, so you get in the right environment. How many of y'all have ever been in a worship service, and it was like, man, chains fell off. Things just got free. Like you were just like, man, I came in one way, but I left another way just because of the right environment. How many of y'all know you get in the wrong environment, some things come out too? 
Come on, you get in the wrong environment, you wind up married. <laughs> you wind up in Vegas with some old gal. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> what, stays in, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And you're like, man. How in the world did that happen? Well, baby, you got in the wrong environment and things, bad things start happening. And we've, uh, many of you have experienced some of those environments. I was called to preach at, at, uh, at a youth camp in Kerrville, Texas. My parents made me go to church. They made me go to these things. Some of these things I did not want to go to. But, but you know, my, my, my dad said, you're going to church with your mother, even though he didn't go. He was like, you're going to church with your mother. And I'm like, well, you aren't going. You're going to church with your mother, right? He didn't care. So I went to church with my mother. They forced me to go to school, boo, and they forced me to go to church, right? So I didn't really want to do any of them. But how many of y'all know as a kid you have environments forced upon you? And, and a lot of you, you've had very bad experiences as kids. There's people that get abused and get uh, abandoned and neglected. A lot of terrible things happen out of those environments. And in that environment, a lot of bad things can happen. The first time I was exposed to pornography was I was in probably the first or second grade. That there was, uh, and I, me and Elizabeth were just talking about this a few days ago. Because we don't think about these things. It's been 40 years ago or 35 years ago. But I remember there was a boy in my neighborhood that, that I was friends with. And I went over to his house. And I remember his dad had a stack of Playboys about six feet. You know, they're, they were as tall as me. And it became my new favorite place in the neighborhood. Even though I was a child, first grade, a child. That environment opened up a portal and it opened up a door that I've had to deal with and that people have to deal with. How many other things happen in those environments that the Lord can heal all things? And the Lord can, he can fix all things. But there are environments that, are, that, that a kid is in that many times through no fault of their own or uh, they're, they're the subject of people that are not great parents, shouldn't be parents, or whatever you want to call it. But out of that environment, things can, doors can open, portals can open that can, that can mess things up. But on the same hand, as a young person, my parents did make me go to church. And I remember going to Kerrville, Texas at a youth camp, you know, and they would have these meetings at night. And and they would pray for all of us, uh, all of us teenagers. And I remember getting prayed for. And I remember from that moment on, I was going to work for the Lord. I knew that he wanted me to work for him. I did not want to do that. It terrified me. I thought he was going to make me a missionary. Specifically, I thought he was going to send me to Russia. And the only thing I knew about Russia is they wore those big black hats. And, uh, you know, I just thought, man, I'm going to have to marry a Russian and it's going to be cold, and I'm going to have a big black hat, and I just don't want to do that. So for years, I stayed away from the presence of God because I was convinced he was going to make me go do something that I didn't want to do. And yet in that environment, that it was an, it was an environment where God was moving and God was speaking, that call came, and I heard it out of that environment. So whether it's a Tuesday night Bible college night or whether it's a first Thursday like we just had or whether it's a Sunday morning, you can put yourself in environments that are conducive to God's voice. They're conducive to the plan of God and the call of God upon your life. And for 26 verses, God worked on man's environment before he ever put him there. And you see, all throughout Scripture, God came to a guy named Simon. And Simon just means reed. And it's just a picture of a reed that blows in the wind. And Jesus came to Simon and he said, I'm changing your name to Peter. I'm changing your name to a rock. No longer are you going to be blown back and forth. I'm going to change your name to a stone. And he came to a man named Jacob. And Jacob's name literally means deceiver. And he lived up to his name. How many of y'all know what happens at the house? It can get in the kids. And, it can, and, and literally uh, his name means deceiver. And we see Jacob always deceiving people. He deceives his brother. He deceives his dad. He's always a victim of deception. And he is a deceiver himself until God shows up. He says, I'm going to change your name. And I'm going to call you Israel. And no longer will you be called Jacob. I'm going to call you Israel. He comes to a man named Saul of Tarsus. And he becomes Paul the apostle. And he comes to a man named Abram. And he said, Abram, I'm going to change your name to Abraham. How many of y'all like Ham? How many of y'all think if God's going to add anything to your name, might as well be Ham? He says, I'm going to call you Abraham. 
And that just means I'm going to make you a father of nations. And he said, there's going to be kings that come out of you. There's going to be a nation that comes out of you. And everywhere you can see, as far as your eyes can see, so this is going to be your land of your people. And he says, how in the world is this going to happen? He says, are you going to give a, a, a child to an old man? He says, I'm old. And you're telling me you're changing my name to a father of nations? And he said, what about my wife? He says, I'm changing her name too. She's no longer going to be called Sarah. I, she'll be called Sarah. And it was so funny because she actually laughed at the promise. She was like, can, 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 can I be pleasured in my old age? In other words, her and Abraham, they're old, right? They just, they're, not, uh, they're not having those relations uh, anymore. And, and she's beyond the age of childbearing. But how many of y'all know God, God is amazing? So God comes to Abram. He says, I want to do this in your life. But in order for that to happen, he says, the first thing you're going to have to do to see it come to pass, and I'll show you this in Genesis chapter 12. He comes to Abram, and he says, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country. In other words, he says, you're going to have to change environments. What I want to do in you, I can't do in you where you are. And often we sense God wants to do things in our life, but because we're consistently in the wrong environment, the wrong things come out. How many of y'all know bad actions come out of bad environments? You get in the wrong environment, and usually the wrong things happen. There's a lot of good people in jail. A lot of good people. I've preached in prisons for years. A lot of great men and women in prison who through the bad environment of their home that they grew up in, or bad environment they found themselves in under the, the control, or you could just say using substances, however you want to put it, bad decisions get made, and now they're stuck for years in an environment they don't want to be in. And God tells Abram, he says, you're going to have to get out of your country. He says, you're going to have to leave your family and your father's house. How many of y'all, for some of y'all, that'd be good news. Say, man, my family's crazy. I'm ready to get away from them. Like, I, I want to. Well, it doesn't say whether or not he wanted to. It just said God wanted him to. And, it, and he says, I'm going to bring you to a land that I will show you. And watch, this is what I want you to see. He says, and I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. And you'll be a blessing. In other words, God said, I can't make you into what I, I need you to be until you get in the right environment. Because your current environment is not where I can make you. And sometimes we feel like we have to be the ones doing the making. I've got I've to do, I've got to figure it out. I've got I've to know. And God says, if, if you'll be in the right environment, it won't be a struggle. If you will be in the right environment, he says, I'll make you. Jesus came to a bunch of fishermen, tax collectors. I mean, think about it. Peter wore the white boots. How many of y'all seen the white boots in southwest Louisiana? Come on, now you know what the white boots are. You work, you work on a shrimp boat, a crap boat, a, uh, an oyster boat. You work on a fish boat. And these boys, they, they're blue-collar boys with white boots on. And, and Luke is, is, is a physician. Matthew is a tax collector. He sits in a cubicle. And Jesus comes to all of them and he says, follow me and I will make in other words, if you'll leave your environment and come over to my environment, I'll make you what you're supposed to be. You don't have to do it. I'll do it. Just by you being at the right place at the right time with the right people, you'll be right in the middle of what I've called you to be. And in my life, you know, we've had this play out different ways. But, but the spiritual environments uh, have been critical to, 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 to me and, and my, my family. But how many of y'all know it's not just the spiritual environments that matter? How many of y'all know the environment of your home matters? How many of y'all know oftentimes it's more important the environment outside of the church than it is the environment inside the church? Because at, at home, things that, that, that young people are introduced can make all the difference in their life. Whenever I was uh, uh, studying this week, I began to look. There's a very prominent woman in Scripture named Michael. And she is actually a princess, a real deal, bona fide princess. Her daddy is a king. And she's got all the luxuries of life. She's got everything going for her. But she does not regard the presence of God. She doesn't care about the presence of God. She doesn't want the presence of God. She's not interested in the presence of God. But the problem is, is that she married somebody that does. 
And I mean, I know there's a lot of times relationships wind up that way where one spouse is for the things of God and another spouse is not for the things of God. So Michael is, is, is married to a boy named David. And all of you guys that have heard of David, you know David's story. David got to be this woman's husband because he killed Goliath. Goliath came out and he's taunting people and, and he's saying, you know, that he's going to do all these things. David shows up and he says, what, what do I get if I kill Goliath? And they said, you get to marry a princess. He said, give me a rock. Give me a rock. This is my ticket out, baby. I've been, I've been sleeping with sheep. For the past 14 years. You mean I get to move to a palace and sleep with a princess? Let's go. So the Bible says he runs at Goliath. He slings the rock. He, and as he's going, he tells Goliath, he says, Today I'm going to cut your head off and I'm going to feed your body to the birds. You're going to be delivered into our hands. And how many of y'all know he did, God did, and he got Michael. He got this woman, and I'm sure she looked good. I'm sure she was all uh, uh, beautiful. And the Bible says Michael loved David. The problem is is that she didn't love the presence of God. And we see this play out in 2 Samuel chapter 6 verse 14. David is bringing God's presence back to Jerusalem. Now, it's kind of hard for us to understand this, but back then God's presence was in a box. There was a box, and in that box was the Ten Commandments. In that box was a jar of manna. In that box was Aaron's rod that budded. And God said, I want you to put all these artifacts in this box. Put two angels on top of the box. Overlay it in gold, and I'll meet you there. That'll be my presence. And everywhere they carried this box, they would have victory, and things would go well for them. And then, But then they would kind of screw up and walk away from the Lord, and the enemy would come in and fight with them and take Take the box away. So there was constantly in the Old Testament, they would, have the, they would have God's presence, they would lose God's presence. They would have God's presence, they would lose God's presence. And at this time in history, they didn't have God's presence, but David got it back. That David had defeated the Philistines, and they finally got the box back. And it says, David danced before the Lord with all of his might. He's so excited. He's like, man, we finally got God's presence back. Because you've got to understand, David loved God's presence. He wrote the 23rd Psalm and the 34th Psalm and the 91st Psalm. While he's out there tending sheep, he's worshiping the Lord. And he created an atmosphere out there all by himself where the Spirit of God would come. And he would minister to the Lord and the Lord would minister to him. And he was a psalmist and he would write and it was beautiful. And he loved, he, he longed for the presence of God. So whenever he finally got this box, and it was God's presence, he said, I'm returning the box to Jerusalem. I'm bringing it to the temple where it belongs. And he's so excited, he danced before the Lord with all of his might. That just means uninhibited. He didn't care what anybody was thinking, saying, watching. I mean, you know, he wasn't doing it for them. He was, he was celebrating before the Lord. And David was wearing a linen ephod, and that just means he was wearing the garments of a priest, not a king. He took off his kingly garments, and he said, I'm just a man worshiping God. And he's wearing an ephod, and that's what the priests would wear. And it says, David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, this is important, Saul's daughter, And the point is, is the reason she didn't have any regard for the presence of God is because her daddy didn't. The reason she didn't care about the presence of God is because her daddy didn't. That it wasn't modeled in the home. In fact, Saul had the box, but you know what he did with it? He put it in a field for 20 years. He didn't want anything to do with it. Saul had had the box at one time. But he disregarded the presence of God. He said, I don't care about the presence of God. I don't need the presence of God. I'm the king. And he literally set the box on the side of the road and left it there for 20 years. Well, he lost his kingship. David became king in his place. And David said, baby, we're not leaving that box in the field. If there's one thing I need in this life, it's the presence of God. That's the only thing I need in this life. So he is dancing. He is celebrating. He's got it back. But Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window. And she saw King David leaping. And whirling before the Lord. Have y'all been in a church service like that? <laughs> I'm just kidding. 
Some of y'all maybe saw that. You're like, man, people right there are excited about Jesus. Well, how many of y'all know we get excited about lesser things? The saints win. We'll lose our mind and paint Florida leaves from nipple to nipple. <laughs> Wear big funny hats and we'll go bananas if the saints win, right? I mean, goodness gracious, I've seen people lose their mind over LSU. This guy here, he's actually losing his mind over God's presence. He's whirling around, jumping up and down. She saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. She loved him, but she despised the presence of God and what he was doing. Verse 20, it says, And then David returned to bless his household. After he gets done bringing the ark, setting it in the temple, he wants to go home to his wife, bless their house, and celebrate with her. But Michael, the daughter of Saul, keep saying that, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, Oh, how glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself in the eyes of the maids of his servants. You are as one of the base fellows, shamelessly uncovers himself. But David said to Michael, it was before the Lord. He chose me instead of your father and all his house. He appointed me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I'll be even more undignified than this. In other words, he said, you ain't seen nothing yet. God did in my life what your daddy didn't do or anybody else could do. God put me here. And then I love this, and he says, and I'll humble, I'll be humble in my own sight. In other words, his worship for him was an act of humility. He said, I'll take off the royal robe. I'm not just a king, I'm a priest, I'm a worshiper. And he got in the presence of God and created that atmosphere, but she didn't like it. But as for the maidservants of whom you've spoken, by then I will be held in honor. Now, right now, he's getting into some trouble. He need, they need marriage counseling right here because now he's like, your daddy and all these women, they like whenever I do this. It's like, man, he's really he's stirring up more devils than he can cast out. He's about to get in big trouble. But therefore, watch this. Michael, they say it again, the daughter of Saul, she had no children until the day of her death. In other words, she became barren. And barren just means she couldn't produce what she desperately wanted. That she desperately wanted things that she herself couldn't produce. Only God could produce them. But because she had no regard for the presence of God, she was never in an environment where it could be produced. And we often read that, and I've read it through the years, and I really look down on Michael. Like, oh, Michael, she's really a work. She's a piece of work. I'm glad I'm not married to her. But it says she loved David, and David loved her. But the problem is, is it wasn't modeled in her home. That Saul prioritized other things over the presence of God. So she prioritized other things over the presence of God. And how many times in our lives do we prioritize in front of our kids things besides the presence of God? That we'll elevate sports or we'll elevate academics or we'll elevate all different other things. We'll, we'll celebrate them. But when it comes to the presence of God, we're very kind of... But how many of y'all know... Uh, Kids pick up on what you value, and they model what you value. So for us as Christians, right, it's vitally important for us to not value everything like Saul valued, but to put a premium on the presence of God. Because the presence of God is the only thing that can help you produce things that you can't produce on your own. And how many of y'all know land can be barren, people can be barren? That no matter what what seed you put in the ground, it won't produce because the land is barren. And here, Michael, she became barren. She desperately wanted to produce something, but she didn't have the power to produce it. Only God did. But because she despised the presence of God, she couldn't step into it. And if you remember Jesus in the New Testament, in red letters, if you read it, and Jesus often talked in these weird kind of parables, these little stories. And some of them are easy to understand, and some of them are quite difficult to understand. In fact, the disciples would come privately to Jesus and be like, what are you talking about? 
And then he would be like, okay, to you it's been granted to know the secrets of the kingdom. In other words, because you're close to me and you really want to know, I'll tell you the mysteries. But to everybody else, he said, they're, they're going to be left in the fog. I mean, I know you can know as much or as little about God as you want. So he would explain to them, but he actually told them this one parable. He says, if you understand this parable, you'll understand every parable. If you don't understand this parable, you will understand no parables. And the parable was, he says, a farmer goes out with a handful of seed. And the seed is good. In other words, how many of y'all know seed is pretty amazing? If you take one kernel of corn and put it in the ground, it becomes millions of kernels. That within that seed, God has engineered and DNA'd that thing to multiply exponentially. So the problem's not the seed. Jesus says the problem is, is if you put the good seed in the wrong environment, it won't produce. So he says, it doesn't matter how good the seed is. He says, if you put it over here, this, it won't produce. You put it in here, it won't produce. A third one, he says, you put it in there, it won't produce. But he says, when the seed finds good ground, when the seed finds the right environment, he says, 30, 60, 100 fold, it's exponential. So for us, it's more about finding the plan of God, the will of God, all these types of things. It's not elusive. It's not hard to find. It's more about just being at the right place, the right environment. And we create that environment in our homes, in our cars. How many of y'all know your car has an environment? My brother's not here. He's so funny. But uh, he used to listen to like a slipknot. Now, if you don't know what slipknot is, it's this loud, like aggressive, like, oh, I want to eat your face. It's that type of stuff. Like, you're going to die. Like, it's really crazy kind of music like it's really and, and and then Reagan would be like I get so angry and I'm like bro bro I've been in your car man it's like that stuff you're listening to they're talking about like eating people's face and like killing and like bad stuff like man you may want to change the environment of your car he's like I don't know why I'm so angry it's like I got it I can give you a clue like maybe if if you wouldn't be listening to Slipknot on the way home from work, that may open a portal of joy into your life. Like the, 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 your car can have an environment. Your house can have an environment. So, so the, it's interesting, and I, I, I've got I've to quit, but thir- 29 times in the New Testament, Jesus dealt with an unclean spirit. He specifically calls it unclean. And if you look at when God brought things from out of order into order, how many of y'all know just, how many of y'all have ever wanted to buy a car until you washed your own? And then you were like, this is actually a pretty nice car. It's like whenever you actually like armor all it and like clean it, you're like, man, this, this is actually a pretty nice car. Yeah, once you get, you know, the old French fries out of the back seat and it doesn't smell like a diaper, it's like, man, this is actually a pretty nice, just bringing order to your closet can bring joy. Just changing a physical environment can, can, can rearrange things in such a way. But Jesus, 29 times, he dealt with what he called an unclean spirit. That, that there is a spirit of impurity that he wants to deal with. And once he dealt with it, once that environment internally changed, it opened up a whole new world for them. But there's one particular part of it that's really kind of scary. And this is what I see a lot as a pastor. And, 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 and I will finish with this. I have a couple other things. But, but we won't get. How many of y'all know you can't, tell, you can't do all of it one Sunday? Y'all are like, tell me about it. I'm ready to get to my environment of lunch. To get to my lunch environment. Matthew chapter 12 verse 43. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, that unclean spirit, it goes through dry places and it's seeking rest, but it finds none. In other words, Jesus says, I deal with unclean spirits, but once I cast them out, they immediately immediately start looking for a place to re-enter. If you remember whenever Jesus cast the demon out of that man, he sent him into the pigs. Because those spirits, they need a body. They need something to go into. So Jesus sent them into the swine, into the pigs. Jews are not supposed to eat pork anyway. And you had a bunch of Jewish people raising pigs. 
So Jesus sent those spirits into the pigs. And if you remember that, they all committed suicide. That's, that's a church joke. It's like chop suey. They all committed suicide. And they all jumped off. Uh, some of y'all get that on your way home. Uh, they, they jumped off the cliff. And then all those Jewish people got mad at him. They were doing something they weren't supposed to be doing. He sent the, the evil spirits into those pigs. The pigs committed suicide. And they all uh, got mad. And the Bible says they pushed Jesus out of the town. Out of the, uh, he, they, they literally made him, made him leave. But the point is, is that whenever Jesus brings cleansiness or whenever he drives out an unclean spirit, he says here, it immediately starts looking for another place to enter. But then he, he finds none. He's like, man, I can't find anyone. This is red letter in your Bible. This is a really important. This is a key to some of yours, the plan, the call of, of, upon your life. And then the evil spirit says, well, I'm going to return, return to the house from which I came. And when he comes back, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. And then he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. What's Jesus talking about? Listen, every Sunday all across this globe, there will be people that will come to the cross of Jesus Christ and get clean. Some of them have not been in church in decades. Some of them are in church every Sunday. And the reason they're there every Sunday is to get clean from Saturday. The problem is, is Jesus says it's not enough just to allow Jesus to clean you. You better allow him to fill you. Because what happens is, is people come to church on Sunday just to get clean from what they did on Saturday. But that same spirit that left them comes right back around on Monday and just finds them all cleaned out. But they didn't fill up on anything. They didn't spend any time in the Word. They didn't put themselves in any environments where the presence of God's flowing. They didn't welcome the presence of the gift. They didn't, they didn't do any of that. They just got clean to feel better. And Jesus said, but yeah, actually in the end, they'll be worse off than they were in the beginning. So the environment that we create is we're not just trying to get Jesus to clean us up so we feel better. I mean, I know we're trying to, uh, we're trying to get Jesus to fill us up so we become a problem. I mean, I know you're a problem for the enemy when you're full. You're not a problem for the enemy when you're clean. Actually, you're just cleaning the house for him to come back. But how many of y'all know whenever you start filling up, you start getting in the right environments, you start answering the call, you start reading the word, you start spending time in his presence, you start, man, for me, the Lord, the Lord maybe, maybe, maybe six months ago, the Lord just challenged me to kneel more. And, and it just challenged me to kneel more. So I found myself kneeling uh, every day. And, and, and this went on for maybe six months or maybe a year. I don't, I don't know. And it's lifted now. I'm not kneeling every day. But there are times still where the, where, the devil, where the Lord may prompt me to take a moment and kneel. But listen, even the act of kneeling creates an environment for me and the Lord. Everything else becomes strangely dim in light of that marvelous grace. So just for me, taking one minute, 60 seconds to say, I bow. There's an environment there. Inevitably, the Lord speaks in that place. Now, I cannot do that. I can resist. I don't feel like I'm busy or somebody's looking at me. But, but if, I, if I yield to that and say, okay, so now I'm going to take this moment and I'm going to create this space, this environment where God will speak. He will speak. He wants to speak. He's longing to speak. So you have a personal environment that you can maintain. You have a home environment. You have a car environment. You have a family environment. You know, for years, even just for our marriage, for the first five years of me and Elizabeth's marriage, we didn't have any kids because we didn't want them messing stuff up. So, Because how many of y'all know kids change the environment? So for five years, we just said, we don't want those, we don't want that, we just want to travel. So we traveled for five years, and we just, you know, uh, we were broke, but we were high on love. And we were happy, right? So the way that we traveled is we would usually cruise, because for four ninety nine you got seven nights and all your meals. I loved it. That midnight chocolate buffet, what a blessing to my young broke life. 
All you can eat at by the poolside. What a blessing to my broke life and not having to look at the tab, right? So for five years we did that, and, and we really invested, poured into each other, into that environment of our marriage. But then we start, I started to slip. I started putting the work in front of my wife and started putting ministry in front of my wife, and then she left, right? We split up, and that environment changed again. Now my home environment just became me. And I'm alone, and she's gone. But we started, we, we redated, and we started rebuilding that what we had that we had lost. So then she came home, we reconnected, and we established date nights. And we established some environments that we didn't let anybody else encroach upon because they were environments that we needed to stay spiritually and physically and mentally healthy. So every Friday night, we had date night until the children showed up. And then once the children showed up, we moved it to lunch. And Friday night became family night. So every, and she'll tell you, no, will tell you, and for, for years, Friday night was family night. Nobody messed with our family night. This is us doing family night. And the question was always the same. Every Friday, they get out of school. What do y'all want to do tonight for family night in Lake Charles, Louisiana? You're either going to go to the movie, you're going to go putt-putt, or you're going to go bowling. So we spent most Fridays over here at the bistro eating, and I would sleep because uh, those kid movies just put me to sleep. But I would wake up and act like it was the best movie ever. Shrek was amazing or whatever it was. But we protected that family night until they came to us and said, we don't want to do family night. Y'all are old and boring. We want to be with our friends and go to the football game on Friday night. So we moved family night to Monday night. And now every Monday we light candles. We create a dinner, we have a ritual kind of where we go to, we talk about, uh, give me a scripture or something, tell me something you're thankful for, and we have what we call Shabbat, and, and we do that every Monday. Listen, listen, the point is, is if you, if you don't create environments, you won't have them. But if you'll foster spiritual environments, you'll have them. If you'll foster family environments, you have them. If you foster marriage environments, you have them. Or you can do none of it and wind up like Michael. And again, it's not really Michael's fault because it wasn't quite modeled for her. She had a daddy that didn't care about these things. And when she saw her husband care about it, she despised it. But you can absolutely, you put yourself in the right environment and God will speak 100% of the time. He's, 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 he's good. Hmm. I got more, but I'll stop there. I mean, I know it's not hard, but you kind of have to, you have to fight for it. You have to go after these environments so that the Lord can speak and the Lord wants to say some things. I mean, I'm glad just being at church for an hour today, and the Lord just, even at worship, it's just like, man, how many y'all need a bath? Sometimes you need the Lord just to wash behind your ears a little bit and just to be in his presence and allow him to speak to you and just kind of lighten your load a little bit and and then, and, and then help you, instruct you, and teach you. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful we've got so many young, amazing college kids that could be doing a lot of other things, could be sleeping in right now, waking up and eating ramen noodles. And, and yet they, they prioritize the presence of God. They prioritize coming uh, to the house of God and, and hearing his word. And just in these environments like this, man, God can download things on your hard drive you'll draw upon the rest of your life. The rest of your life, there'll be things, you know, my parents made me go to church. I didn't want to go. But now a lot of the verses that I have memorized, it's not because I memorized them as a pastor. I got them when I was eight. The, the little flannel boards and those little things that, that happen at the VBSs, that those things get down, down on the inside of you, and they become what Jesus called a foundation. You build your house upon that foundation, and he said, when the storms of life come, your house will stand. When everybody else's is crumbling, your house will will stand. The last thing I'll tell you is Jesus wanted to have an intimate moment with his disciples before he died. He's about to go to the cross. They don't know it. And anytime he brings it up, they kind of shut him down like, you can't die, you can't die, you can't die. You know, and they're always telling him stuff like that. But he knows that death is coming, that he's about to die on the cross. But he tells them this. He says, go into the next town. And he says, and whenever you get there, Find a room and prepare for the Passover. In other words, he says, I need y'all to go ahead and find a space, 
create a space and prepare a space for me to move. And they didn't know. What they thought they were doing was insignificant. They were just going to go have a meal. But how many of y'all know it was the last meal? It was the last supper. And in that moment, he says, this is my body. This is my blood. Then he takes on an apron. He puts it on and he gets down and begins to wash their feet. Well, you talk about a significant moment in their life and in the history of humanity. But in order for that to take place, they had to go prepare for it. Whenever there was an invitation on the day of Pentecost, Jesus told 500 people, he says, you 500 people don't leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit shows up. God's going to send the promise of the Father. The Holy Spirit's coming. Do not leave this town until the Holy Spirit shows up. Well, 380 left. 380. And you can't fault them, right? Because, I mean, some of them, I'm sure they had a boss. It was like, your butt better be back at work on Tuesday. It's like, well, the Lord told me to stay in Jerusalem. It's like, well, I'm the Lord of your paycheck, and your butt better be here, right? How many of you ever had a boss like that, right? The bosses don't always care, you know. It's like, well, me and Jesus were having a moment. It's like, your butt better be in class, you know. So, but, but 380, they didn't show up. But the 120 that did, the Holy Spirit came in like a rushing mighty wind, and cloven tongues of fire set up on all of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit began to speak in other tongues and the Spirit gave them utterance and then the, I mean, everything changed out of that environment so God's always trying to get things to us it's not hard he's just trying to get us to a position and a place where we can hear his voice and uh, I love our church because we foster these types of things this is what we go after this is what we want the most it's God just for you to show up and reign Rain down on us. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you for the times of refreshing that come from your presence. God, that there's things that we want that only you can do. But if we despise your presence or ignore your presence or move away from your presence or prioritize other things above your presence, we become barren. We become unable to produce what we want and what you want. God, we recognize that the seed is not the problem, that it's the environment. God, that whenever we get in the right environment, you speak. You speak. God, I pray for every person here or every person on the sound of my voice. God, that they hear you clearer than they've ever heard you before. God, that whenever you wake them up in the middle of the night, you come through loud and clear in that environment. When they make a choice, to bow their knees, God, that they create that space where you speak loud and clear. God, I pray for every person here that they foster an environment in their homes where their kids see where the priorities are and that the priorities are on the presence of God. And God, whenever we create venues, whenever we create space and opportunities, God, you always show up. You give us your flesh. You give us the bread. You give us the cup. And God, you wash our feet. You serve us whenever we create that space. God, I thank you for every college kid here, God, that they're learning how to host the presence of God, how to go after it, put it first in their life. God, that they'll take off everything else that tries to clothe them, that they'll put on a linen ephod, and that they worship you. That they put you first. God, we recognize in the history of the church and where the world is right now. God, that we're choosing to leave the presence of God in a field. But I believe you're calling us to pick it up. Bring it to the forefront of our life. So that we can hear and know the plan, the call, the will of God for our life. God, we thank you for our time. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence and glean from you that you satisfy us. If you're here and you need prayer for anything today, I want to close the service, but want to make sure you have an opportunity. Some of you maybe never been here before. Some of you maybe feel far from the Lord. Some of you, wherever you're at, doesn't matter. Just want to make sure you have an opportunity. If you need prayer for anything, if you're here and you've 
you're not born again. You say, man, I don't know if I have eternal life. I don't know the Lord. I don't know any of those things. Maybe you had a relationship with the Lord as a child, as a teenager, but you have not been going after the presence of God. And you just say, hey, man, I need to put this, I need to put God's presence in the center of my life. I need to put him in the center. I need to prioritize him. I'd love to pray with you, pray for you, not going to embarrass you, but I, I want to give you an opportunity if that's you. Just say, hey, I need to make some adjustments in my life, in my heart. If that's you, I'm asking you to raise your hand. Look across and make sure. Yep, 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 yep. God, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. God, we make the adjustments. God, that you, we make the adjustments. That we move around what needs to be moved around. Come on, part of the end of the service is where we just allow the Lord to shine a light in the crevices of our heart. Say, so what environments do you need to move away from? He told Abram, you need to get away from that if you want to go forward. What, what, do, what do you need to walk away from? What do you need to walk towards? God, we allow you to make the adjustments so that we'll be fruitful. We won't be barren, but we'll be fruitful. Let's make a confession of faith. Everybody say, Lord Jesus, you are the center of my life, and you are my all in all. I confess your lordship over my life, and I thank you for speaking to me, visiting me. And when I create an environment for you, you always show up. You said you would make the crooked things straight. High places come down and low places come up. You make a way where there seems to be no way. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Everybody stand up on your feet. If you need prayer for anything else, we have prayer counselors down here at the front. We have prayer counselors down here at the front. And just so you know, going into 2025, how many of y'all know we'll be there before you know it? Come on, you'll be hanging Christmas lights on your tree. In a few weeks, and it'll be 2025. In, in the in next year, for all of our first Thursday services, we're going to have what we're calling just like revival nights. So we're just presence nights, whatever you want to call them. So the first Thursday of January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, those 12, uh, we're going to have those uh, moments where we just kind of uh, create a space, create a presence uh, where God can move and speak and all those types of things. So if you need prayer for anything else, come down to the front. I'm going to bless you before you go. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you. May the Lord use you this week. Create environments where he can speak. He can speak. And we say, speak, Lord. We're listening. In Jesus' name, everybody said, hey, God bless you. I love you. You are dismissed.